Well, welcome to the church or the Mount of Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount was preached from here. It says he went up onto a hill to a flat spot. He sat down and he began to teach them. What does the Beatitudes mean? They are the blessings. He taught the Sermon on the Mount here, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, three chapters of the Bible. In this talk here, in this place, we're gonna talk here about the location a little bit. We'll talk about a little bit about the historical background. Then we're gonna walk around and explore the site. It is Christ's longest recorded sermon. We're going to have a Bible teaching and see all of the things in the Bible that took place here. We're gonna highlight some of the parts of the Sermon on the Mount right here, embracing and just soaking it in, just like the people that Jesus taught. You're gonna be sitting in the very area where Jesus taught around 2,000 years ago. So now we're all inside, right? This is the Church of the Beatitudes, or the Mount of Beatitudes. Why do we call it the Mount of Beatitudes? The Beatitudes are the blessings. When Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount, it's blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now the Sermon on the Mount is going to encompass far more than just the 13 first verses of the, of the blessings or the Beatitudes, and we'll talk about that here in a moment, but it's called the Mount of Beatitudes today. In the time of Jesus, it didn't have necessarily a name. And over to our left, we have a pretty fountain that says, let anyone who thirst come to me and drink, for whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water shall flow from within him. Now in Hebrew, this mountain is called Mount Nahum, similar to the latter part of the word Capernaum, which means a place of rest. Today this place is called the Mount of Beatitudes, which means Blessed Mountain in Latin. It's located just up above the Sea of Galilee on its northern side. The mountain rises to a height of about 500 feet or 150 meters above the Sea of Galilee. Now this church that we're looking at is called the Church of Beatitudes. It's an eight-sided church built in 1938 for a Franciscan order of nuns. The eight sides of the church represent the eight Beatitudes shown in Latin in the upper part of the windows inside. Now interestingly, a Byzantine church was erected in around 350 AD just down the slope a bit from this current site and was used until around 650 AD. So we do believe that this is the place, once again, these early Christians marked out these sites and they venerated them and they didn't forget where they were because there was no one like Jesus. It's really, really special just to, to be here and just to, just to think about this. We'll walk down, we'll walk all around, and you'll be able to see a great, great view of the Sea of Galilee. This church here, once again, has great acoustics. It was built in the 1930s. There's also a, a monastery here, okay, as well, a functioning monastery. So I think you're gonna find this very, very meaningful, this place right here. Okay, so let's go ahead now and explore. Let's see if we can go inside the church. You kind of go in, then you kind of, it's an octagon inside and it will have the Beatitudes uh, inside as well. Notice in the center of the church an altar. It is made of alabaster and onyx. On the floor, all around the altar, are mosaic squarish tiles written in Latin that show seven virtues. 
and then one of the tiles says, Praise be to Christ. The virtues written on the tiles say, Fortitude, Charity, which is love, Prudence, Faith, Justice, Hope, and Temperance. So isn't it really special to be here and to ponder the virtues and the principles of Christ's kingdom? If you look at the top, you can see the Beatitudes. There's eight Beatitudes there. They're written in Latin. So this uh, church right here, this area here is a monastery, okay? So this is a Catholic facility. And I should say that most of the sites that you're gonna see where the churches are, are Catholic. So I just wanna explain this uh, quickly, is that when the uh, early church began, it wasn't necessarily Catholic, okay? It, uh, the word Catholic means universal, okay? So the early church was the church, right? Over time, around six, seven, eight hundred A.D. is when the Catholics began to add things to the Bible, like purgatory, different things that weren't really in the Bible, okay? So they kept adding them on, and then they had the idea that the authority was in the Pope or in the, the leadership. And so when the Reformation happened, Luther and these different ones led the Reformation, what they said is, no, the Catholics, the authority does not reside in people or the leaders or the Pope. It resides in the Word of God. That's where you get the solas, sola escritura, just the Word of God. And so the authority now for the Reformers, the, the Reformation was God's Word is our maximum authority. Okay, But these facilities and these buildings, like I say, they were begun shortly after Christ, a lot of times, you know, the churches, a lot of them were built in the Byzantine period. It's basically the time that the Romans had occupation. Then the Roman Empire kind of divided and you had the Eastern side, which is more the Byzantine side. So when we refer to the word Byzantine, it's just kind of a common phrase. It refers to from the period of around 324 AD, starts with Constantine, and then goes up to about seven or 800 AD because then the Muslims are going to come on the scene, okay? And then it's going to be the Crusaders, then the Muslims back again. Just so you understand a little bit about some of these sites, a lot of them are Catholic. But once again, we're, we're grateful that these sites have been, have been set aside and preserved. Otherwise, they'd be lost. Things have cleared out here a little bit. It's like they kind of come in waves. So up here we have a guest house, and once again we do have a functioning uh, monastery up here. Okay, well now we're gonna make our way down to where we're going to do our faith lesson, which overlooks the beautiful Sea of Galilee. We're gonna be seeing the very same sights that Jesus and the disciples would have seen as Jesus preached this famous Sermon on the Mount message. So this is gonna be really, really special. We're gonna do our Bible teaching right here. Okay, so you can, uh, if for those of you that are agile, don't fall, but you can come down. I'm going to stand down there. If you want to just get a rock to sit on, be just kind of like in the time of Jesus. Well, now we're going to come to the Bible teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount, Mount of Beatitudes. So, man, it doesn't get any better than this, does it? Here you are sitting on rocks in the very area where the multitudes would have sat to hear Jesus teach his longest recorded sermon. There might have been longer sermons, I'm sure there were, but this is the longest recorded 
teaching that we have in Scripture of Jesus. Absolutely unbelievable, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, once again, we are overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Now, we know that Christ used nature a lot in his teachings, right? As he walked by, he would talk about the birds in the air. He would talk about the lilies and the things that grew. So he would use nature quite a bit. I believe one of the reasons why he chose this area to do the Sermon on the Mount is because what are you looking at? I mean, gee whiz, talk about a gorgeous view. Okay, so as he's teaching, then people can see the greatness of God. We know that God speaks to us through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. A nature speaks out. We know in Romans 1, we know that God exists by all the things that we see. So God used nature a lot. Christ used nature in his teachings. So it's very likely that one of the reasons why he did here is because as you're looking at this, oftentimes when we are in a state of pondering or maybe we're having problems or whatever, a lot of people go up on top of mountains, right? And they'll go up onto a mountain and they'll just, they'll think. It's a time to just kind of get away and to think. So I believe as Christ was teaching here that the people, as they listened to him, it was like, wow, I mean, his words were so powerful because the Sermon on the Mount ends with, he spoke with authority like no one else. And so they're just taking all this in. They've got the greatness up here. They can see all this. And so I believe that Christ used this to even greater amplify his message. And here we are 2,000 years later in the very spot, gonna read the very same words. He spoke in probably Aramaic or Hebrew, but we're gonna hear these same words in our language that the people back then did. We'll read the, the Beatitudes. Now, what does the Beatitudes mean? They come from blessings. They're really the eight blessings. Blessed are you, blessed are you. And what you're gonna find in this sermon, this message, is that Christ is gonna flip everything. To us, what would seem like a blessing seems opposite. So what Christ says are blessings, the human mind is like, no, that's not a blessing. That's not a blessing. In fact, as we read this, you will see that, oh yeah, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't choose that. So he kind of flips everything. Now also, God used mountains many times. Many theologians will liken the Sermon on the Mount to the law given on Mount Sinai. It's the new covenant law, so to speak. So in the same way that God spoke on Mount Sinai and gave the law, the old covenant, Christ said, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. So the Sermon on the Mount, he's on a mountain. It's almost like he's now giving the new covenant from a, a, another mountain. It's Christ now giving the summary of the new covenant, so to speak. So some similarities there. So let's read these Beatitudes. They start in Matthew chapter five. It says, seeing the crowds, so there was a large crowd. He went up on the mountain and when he sat down and his disciples came to him. So we have these crowds. He sits down, his disciples come and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. What's poor in spirit? That's a person who doesn't think that they have it all together, so to speak. Is not a arrogant person, is not a proudful person, it's a person who's teachable. A person who's teachable. All right, so blessed are the poor in spirit, or the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We don't really like to mourn, do we? We oftentimes avoid the tears. We don't like to be sad. We don't like, you know, those kind of things. But he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, the humble, the teachable, those who don't think greatly of themselves. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I just wanna just say a word to you guys. I really admire each one of you guys because the fact that you're here speaks volumes about you. It tells God how much you really love him. 
Okay, you've made great sacrifices to come to be, to see where God spoke to mankind, where Jesus spoke, and so it speaks volumes about you. So I believe that even this trip here, that you're hungering, thirsting after righteousness, uh, God is going to reward you for that. So thank you for your, your love for the Lord. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart means to be like singularly focused upon God. A person who's devoted, doesn't have a lot of gods, so to speak, in their lives, has a central God, is not distracted by all the, the cares and worries of life and all those kind of things. They're a devoted person. And then it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And then here's one that is really, seems backwards. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you or mock you or, or say bad things about you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we are living in a day when things are rapidly unraveling and what is good we call evil and what is evil we call good. And so when we say things against that, we are the ones who are viewed as bad. We are being judgmental. All these things we're accused of, of being so the tables are turning and I know things are happening fast. I know that in Canada, I know in England just passed a law that, that the Bible is like anti-human. And like in Canada, I know that they're passing laws where pastors can't speak about certain things. It's coming to the U.S. as well. It's happening fast. It won't be long when, when pastors will have to make a choice whether they're really going to speak the truth about morality or whether they're just going to cave in. So we're seeing this, but Christ says, blessed are you when you're persecuted. And the people that he spoke to, many of them would be persecuted, as we've talked about the early Christians and the, and the price that they paid. So he says, rejoice. We don't have a tendency to rejoice in persecution. But he says, rejoice. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you look at the prophets, being a prophet was not an easy life. Christ begins with the Beatitudes, these blessings, and then he's going to go on and teach about a number of different topics. And we'll just kind of look at them, uh, overview these topics. We won't read the whole sermon because it's three chapters long. But Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses the true essence of anger. He talks about adultery. He talks about divorce. He talks about keeping your word. He talks about how to treat our enemies. He talks about giving. He talks about prayer. When you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. When you pray, don't you know, announce it and, and uh, stand on the street corners, but go into your closet, means you're alone, and pray to your Father who sees in secret, and He will reward you. The word reward is mentioned nine times in the Sermon on the Mount. And then He taught about storing your riches in heaven and how to handle worry and stress. Okay, and I'm gonna read this part to you. So it says in Matthew 6, 19, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he says, don't store up for yourself treasures here, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven because everything we store up here is going to be eradicated, it's going to be eliminated, it's going to be wiped away. And everything that we store up in heaven is, will meet us there and we will enjoy the rewards of that for eternity. I lost my dear father uh, just a little over a year ago. He was a very hard working man. He worked very hard but he died in, in a room in our house down in Mexico, came down to visit us. When my dad died, they took him out and he took nothing with him. 
He loved his tools, he was a mechanic, he loved all these things, but he, he, took, he took none of that stuff with him. We should work hard, it's not wrong to have money, God loves to bless us, but we want to use our resources, we want to use our time, our energy, we want to really have an eternal focus. So that's what Christ is really doing here. And that's what, that's what God does throughout Scripture. The real wise person is an eternally minded person realizing that all of this right here is very temporal and this is not our real home. And, and the purpose of our life here is not necessarily to be happy, but it's to be uh, holy. It's, it's to, to serve God and to grow to become like Him in nature. It says in, in Romans 8.28, for God causes all things to work together for the good to those who are called according to His purposes. And then 8.29 says, for those He knew beforehand, He predestined to be conform to the image of His Son. So God's plan for us is to conform us to become like Him, have an eternal mind and prepare us for heaven. All, this, all the difficulties will help us to appreciate heaven more. So He's teaching us some simple principles, but our plan for our lives oftentimes is very different than what His plan is for our lives. So Christ is really trying to help people to get their eyes off of now and upon Him and eternity. Then he's going to talk about how to handle stress. We all need a lesson on that, right? He says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious, worried about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. We can hear them, same birds that we hear when Jesus was here. So, look at the birds of the air, Jesus says. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. These birds don't have any storehouse anywhere. They live mouth to mouth. He says, and you, are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So our worries and our stress is a lack of faith. It's the belief that God's not really going to take care of me, and then as we were saying, but we do have a role and that we need to work. It says in 1 Thessalonians, if a person doesn't work, don't let him eat. So God's motivation for laziness is hunger. But oftentimes what we do is we enable a person's laziness by feeding them. But in God's economy, the motivation for laziness, for not having something, is, is hunger. When you're hungry, you're going to go do something, but if it's just given to you, then it doesn't really work so anyway we need to have faith and believe that God's going to provide for us so then he goes on to say therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the Gentiles or non-believers seek after these things and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. God's gonna take care of us. We should seek His kingdom first, and if we're seeking His kingdom first, we're gonna learn the, the principles of success. We're gonna learn to be a good business or a good worker. We're gonna learn to be industrious. We're gonna learn how to treat others. We're going to learn everything that you would need to be a successful person. But, but we need to seek God first and do it His way rather than a selfish way. So we need to seek His kingdom first and His righteousness and then everything falls into place. Everything comes together. But if we get that part messed up, nothing will come out right. Nothing will come out right. So he says, don't be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And then he ends his message with a sober warning 
about the importance of obeying and living out his words, not just listening to them. Okay, so now he's going to use the illustration of the house built upon the sand and the house built upon the rock. So let's read this together. It says, and this is at the end, everyone then who hears these words of mine, he's finishing up his message. In the same way he finished it up then, we're finishing it up now. So everyone who hears these words and does them, we all can hear what separates us is whether we leave it at the hearing or we press on and we put it into practice. So everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So a house built upon the rock. These people back then, a lot of them built their own houses. So they knew and they wouldn't build on the sand, they're gonna build on something solid. And so that's a wise person who builds up his house upon the rock. When the winds come and the storms come, the house is gonna stand. What do the winds and the storms represent? The trials and the troubles of life that we face on a regular basis. When they come, we'll be able to stand. Our house will stand because it's built upon the rock. You know, I'd use my father as an example again. When my father passed away, if we don't have the hope of heaven, I don't know how people that don't know Christ and aren't saved, I don't know how they really cope with, with all of this. I mean, death is, there's just no hope. There's just no hope. There's no meaning, there's no purpose. There's no purpose in the difficulties of life. I'll tell you this, this is really powerful, but maybe you've heard it, is for the non-believer, this life is as close to heaven as they're going to get. And then it's going to get horrifically worse in hell. For the believer, this is as bad as it's going to get. So for the unbeliever, this is as good as it gets. For the believer, this is as bad as it gets. What a contrast. So that's why the non-believer, life is all about having fun now, because this is it. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is it. But for us, it's to serve God so that, because we have a hope. And then he goes on and he says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the floods came and the winds blew, same imagery, and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Great. It just didn't fall, great was the fall. Why? Because this person now is gonna meet their maker whom they have rejected who gave them more than sufficient grace to respond, but they rejected that. And now they're gonna spend eternity separated from their maker in hell. Great is their fall. Great, and their, the, the house represents our lives. So for those of us who are believers, the house is gonna stand, we have a hope. The unbeliever, it's gonna be a great fall. I, I tell people, if, if they could only see heaven for five seconds and hell for five seconds, the world would stop and churches would be full and everyone would be at the altar. So what are some faith lessons that we can take away from this spot here, this very area where Christ spoke 2,000 years ago, of which you're sitting in the very area, hearing the same words that he spoke, and hearing the same birds chirping, seeing the same trees, seeing the same vegetation? What can we take away from this? Well, Christ began his sermon by clarifying the, the principles of true blessings in life, true blessings. 
To us, oftentimes, they, they seem backwards, but that's where the true blessings are. So what about us? Do we uh, choose to have kind of a paradigm shift where we're gonna look at life through God's lens, through His eyes, or will we keep our own glasses on, so to speak, and run in the same thinking patterns where we avoid any kind of persecution. We're silenced because we don't want to be persecuted. We just back away from anything. What will we choose? Also, Christ focused on the heart attitude behind his commandments. He said repeatedly throughout the, his sermon, you have heard it said, but I say to you, but I say to you. And he talked about the heart because the Jews bless their hearts, but they were very ritualistic. And sometimes they measured their spirituality by what they did and what they didn't do. And we can do the same too, not that that's wrong, but really we need to look at our heart, the, the motives behind what we do and why we do what we do. Then Christ talked about stress and the importance of storing our riches in heaven. So what about us? How do we handle stress? Do we pray first or do we react and, you know, get all bummed out and frustrated and angry or whatever? How do we handle stress? Christ said to store up riches in heaven. How are we managing our resources? Like I say, it's not wrong to have money. Some of the most godliest people were very wealthy. King David was very wealthy. Abraham was very wealthy, so money is not, not a problem. And I want to be very careful. I'm not against people having money because I don't believe God is, okay? He, he does bless. But I think what we can all agree on is that we use our resources for His kingdom and for His purposes. And then Christ finished up His sermon by defining a true, truly wise person and a foolish person. The wise person hears and then works on putting that into practice. The foolish person hears, walks away. The doers of the word are the ones who are gonna be justified, righteous before the Lord, and they're the ones who are going to reap the, the benefits and the rewards. When we only hear, we actually bring condemnation upon ourselves because now we know, but we don't do. Now, I'm not saying we're gonna lose our salvation or anything, but we will not reap blessings and the rewards that we could because we just hear. And when we do stand before God and we are judged at the judgment seat of Christ, we won't be able to go back and do a redo. I do a lot of work on the computer. My favorite button is the back, back, back. I made it go back three or four times. But we won't be able to do that when we stand before Christ and give an account. This, this is it, this is the chance that we get. And so we want to be wise people and we want to be doers of His Word and be students of His Word and living out His Word. So are we building our lives on the rock? Is our house on the rock or is our house on the sand? Are we, are we doers or hearers? And we're some of both all the time, but we want to work more and focus more on being doers as much as we can. Heavenly Father, we just want to close this time, Lord, just by just thanking you once again for being able to be here and to hear these same words in the same spot you spoke. Lord, grant us grace. Lord, grant us grace, grace, grace. We need so much grace in our lives, Lord. We need your help to give us sight, to give us vision, to give us desire. Lord, uh, work in our hearts and, and help us to be motivated to truly seek your kingdom first, to seek your kingdom first and to have an eternal focus in life and to truly be doers of your word. Help us to do that, we pray in your name. Amen. Doesn't get any better than this.
Well, thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for this time here. And may God richly, richly bless you guys. And may we be doers of his word as we look out over this beautiful place and hear these beautiful words that were taught by Christ in this very spot here.